Hello, welcome to Maids on Otaku. Come in, have a seat. I'm Justin. And I'm Mike. And we're here to talk to you about anime. And we're also here to try this stuff. This is, okay, the full title is Fentiman's C Traditional Curiosity Cola. <laughs> Apparently botanically brewed, fermented botanical cola drink with ginger and herbal extracts. Which is very, uh, basically a long way of saying this will either be amazing or terrible. That is different. Yeah, um, there is no describing what I have just put in my mouth. If, if you've ever been to the Asian market and you've chewed their, like, Chinese ginger chewing gum, it's about that. Yeah. Pleasant, though. Yeah, no, no, not a, that's not a bad thing. And pleasantly different is always a good thing. Yeah. That's one of the things that we strive to put forth with this show. But what you've found isn't really different or off the beaten path for your find of the week. <laughs> well, no, yeah, I got a... I was collecting this series. Uh, this is... Uh, okay. The, apparently the company is called Hobby Base. Never heard of them outside of this, so it's kind of a miracle this even came here. Uh, this is, of course, a uh, movie version Bell Dandy. Uh, they did a series of all three. They come with these really nice sort of uh, magic circle bases that they kind of float above, so... Uh, do need to find another one of these, though, so I can actually have one open, finally. Yes, especially considering the there are two neat things about this set. Firstly, the set has both movie-accurate color schemes for all the girls, as well as a special red version of all the girls' outfits. Yep. So you've got a nice chase set there. Also, a major reason to display these out of box is, as you'll see right here, Bonpei Kun. Yep. Yeah, each figure comes with a different part of him, and you can assemble them when you get all three. Only thing I don't like about these, I mean, which is a real shame, especially considering these are great sculpts, masterful paint scheme, especially good detail on her eyes and everything. The scale's all wrong. Yes. Uh, as, as you can see here, and you know, I'll put an image up, of course. Uh, here is Here are the three goddesses, you know, comparing their different heights. So you can see, especially between Erd and School, there's a pretty, there's about a head and a half difference. The figures are about the same height. It, it's... And they keep the same heights in the same proportions. So you have a giant School, the tiny Erd, and Bell. Bell. Yeah. <laughs> as Bell. Yeah. This is more evidence, too, of course, of our statement that you will never collect all the, the Oh My, my Goddess. Goddess. Yeah. But, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I used to see these around a bunch, uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, actually I think I saw some in KB Toys of all places. Yes. They're not a hard figure to find, but they're certainly getting harder to find, particularly in good shape, yes. with a good card. But, a beautiful piece of merchandise to have, it's a good entry-level Oh My Goddess figure. Yes. Well, if you don't want something resonant, pro probably pornographic. Yeah, if you... Don't. But, on the subject of Bell, Erd, School, yep. you know, holidays are here. Yep. Now, holidays are usually a time where we think of good cheer, smiles, maybe even falling in love a little bit. Yep. Just general squidginess. So, we decided to talk about one of those genres that just brings a smile to your face and a little bit of love in your heart. Yep. So, stick around. Things are about to get a little magical. So what we're talking about is actually the magical girlfriend genre. Which is one that's pretty near and dear to me and Mike's hearts. Yep. And vastly underrated. Extremely underrated, which is actually what we're setting out to do here today. But more on that as yes. we go on. Firstly... What is it? Well, if you watched episode three, you already know. But yep. Mike, lead this through this as, again. As we said, it basically goes like this. This is Schmuck Everyman. He is painfully average, and depending on the series, has few to no redeeming qualities. And one day, a beautiful girl comes along, who also, by the way, has magical powers. And then, for no good goddamn reason, beautiful magical girl falls head over heels in love, with Schmuck Everyman. Hilarity ensues. Yes. Now, 
Well said, Mike. Yes. The whole setup of Schmuck Everyman meets the girl of his dreams is really just a kind of a classic tale. So classic that it actually dates back to I Dream of Jeannie. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean... Well, I, I think you explained it best years ago, shortly after we first met, why it was such a big hit. It's like, like, oh, I see. Man doesn't know what to do with woman who wants to give him everything. Here, we call that a wife. That really is the joke. The genie, when you really think about it, kind of, sub kind of subscribes to what is termed Nadesco Yamato which is the ideal Japanese woman. This is somewhat strange. It's a concept that's actually explored in one of the pieces we're going to use to illustrate the genre, Ayori Aoshi, as this graceful, ever-giving, ever ever-submissive ever, ever submissive wife. Keep in mind, this is a traditional thing. Well, so it's no traditional and it's up. Japanese. Yeah, it's traditional, <laughs> it's Japanese, no jumping up our ass about it. Yeah. We're not promoting it, we're just saying it's what it is. Also, we're not entirely condemning it, we're just not saying, go out and do this. Yeah. Talk about a rock and a hard place. We're either culturally insensitive for, you know, for condemning it, or we're, you know, or we're misogynistic bastards for, nerds for promoting it. Yes, but you see, that's why it's nice to me be me, be because I don't give a shit who I offend. And it's nice to be me because I'm, yeah, I'm aware of these things. Yes. Sidebar over. <laughs> yeah, sidebar. I Dream of Jean. Yes. Uh, if you're not aware of that... Oh, boy. Um, yeah, I'm surprised you're watching our show, because you're either not into the same things as us, or, God, are you young. Yes. I mean, that was before our times, and we know about yeah. that shit. And, quite frankly, it was on in Nick and Knight. Yeah. Well, it's 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 currently on regular TV. Yeah. It's a classic sitcom, and the classic setup is an astronaut finds a you know, finds a bottle. Bottle has a genie in it. Genie happens to be Barbara Eden, who is oh, Barbara Eden, yeah. and she's a genie, and she grants him wishes, and she moves in with him, and his life is chaos. And he's too much of a schmuck to realize how awesome it is. Also, as we've, another quick sidebar, as we've actually discussed when talking about the show, it's also case in point why people who are logical and tactical like us can't have magical girlfriends because we would break life. A lot of the hilarity comes from Major Nelson never at any point thinks to himself, at least when it really matters, Oh, my girlfriend has ridiculous magic powers. I could use these to improve my life. Because he's a schmuck. Yes. A successful schmuck, but a schmuck. And the setup of impossibly beautiful and practical wife with lo yeah, loser schmuck at dates even further back in sitcom history to the Honeymooners, yes. which is the ancestor of all sitcomery. Yes. A man with a dream. One of these days, Alice. Bang. Zoom. Straight to the moon. Wow. I never realized the first astronauts were so fat. That's not an astronaut, it's a TV comedian. And he was just using space travel as a metaphor for beating his wife. Now, fast forwarding, I Dream of Genie was exported to Japan during the occupation period and was a huge hit. After all, it was colorful, it was cute, it was fun. It featured Barbara Eden wiggling around in a skimpy harem outfit. Which is certainly not the main reason I like the show, but boy, is that an added bonus. So you had a show that was a big hit and became a formative part of many young men's early viewing habits. Yep. Again, <laughs> well, comedy, To be fair, reading. also a few young women's, as we'll discuss in coming up. Absolutely. Not to be unfair. So when these young men and women moved on to becoming artists, animators, mangaka, they all seem to arrive at the same point. That's a really funny setup yeah. for a show. And now that we're doing it in animation, we can do anything. Yes. So, enter the early 1980s. I'll actually just start off with the more or less progenitor of the Japanese magical girlfriend, Lum. Lum. Created by... Rumiko Takahashi. Rumiko yes. Takahashi. 
and directed by Mamoru Oshii. Well, the first half of the TV series and the first two movies also, it's worth noting that he received several death threats because he couldn't stand the, uh, him being Oshii, couldn't stand the uh, majority of the manga versions of the characters, so he basically made them as different as he could while making them similar enough to not lose his job. Although that being said, his... <laughs> honestly, I like what he did with the show, so... And Takahashi, for her part, liked a lot of the things yes. he did. Yeah, she, she did approve of a lot of his choices. The it fans was... were less forgiving. As they tend to be. But the show was a fantastic hit. Humongous hit. Still iconic. Yes. And from that, we started to see other creators... Saying, well, I've got my idea. Yep. And he had a lot of investors, a lot of producers saying, you've got an idea to copy that really popular thing? <laughs> Here's some money. Get it out there. Yep. We got Outlanders. We got Oh My Goddess. We got Iori Aoshu. It just kept rolling on. Up to some very recent examples. I mean, shows that are Magical Girlfriend shows, Saikano... Uh, Melancholy of Harvey Suzumiya. Even weird ones, like Aki-Khan. Yeah, uh, we... Uh, yeah. We're just bringing it up that it's a thing. Don't expect us to explain it. Right. It's a phenomenal genre with a lot to offer. It gets a lot of stick. Yep. So stick with us. We're going to tell you specifically why this genre has been so endearing over the years. So as you guessed from our going on and on in that previous segment, this genre, regardless of what you may think about it, is invariably responsible for some of the most iconic characters and arguably series in all of anime, whether you know it or not. And because I can say three reasons why most people give the genre a lot of stick, a lot of, you know, a lot of grief. <laughs> well, first of all, it's a rom-com, technically, in yeah. most cases anyway. Romantic comedy, situational comedy, so rom-com slash sitcom. There's, so automatically we're talking formulaic, we're talking not always deep, we're talking oftentimes kind of cheaply made. Yeah, it, 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 it's afternoon, put your feet up, eat a sandwich TV. Yes. We will not deny that there's a ton out there like that. Princess Rouge. Yeah. We won't deny that there are reasons to criticize. We're not here to tell you, no, no, no you're all wrong. Well, we we're here to tell you, but. Yes. Well, first and foremost, going in with the characters, uh, like I said, a lot of the, especially the main, the, the aforementioned magical girls themselves are very memorable and nine times out of ten very likable. Yeah. Uh, Bill Dandy, for instance. Yeah. Like, oh god, how many years straight was she voted favorite anime character in An America? Like, oh, was she going had, on like a decade something. Yeah, she held a decade. That the she ruled the new type, the new type female character polls. For or new type, that was it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But not just going off of popularity. Popularity is easy. Yeah. Good, good Lord Naruto is popular. Yeah. What's interesting? What's really worthwhile to say is. Not all of these girls are just cardboard cutouts with some particularly big circles drawn. Yes. A lot. Many are. But there are some who really are full, rounded, beautiful characters with a lot going on, with a lot of depth, well, a lot of texture. Honestly, I would even argue a majority of them are. When you really look at the genre, the genre is carried by the strength of its female characters. Mm. Because Schmuck Everyman has to be Schmuck Everyman to a certain extent. Yeah, one degree or another. He can't be too much of an exemplar, too much of any one thing, because then the magical girlfriend loses her impact. Well, and let, you know, let's be perfectly honest with ourselves. The, the whole thing is... I don't want to use the term power fantasy quite, but at least for a lot of guys, it's kind of along those lines. Like, hey, I'm a schmucky guy. This poor schmuck gives me hope. 
if only on a subconscious level, we cannot deny there are a lot of guys who like these things for that reason. So the schmuck every man does carry a quality. But in some series, but even in some series like uh, oh my again, oh my goddess. Uh, much like Major Nelson from I Dream of Genie, he's a very, you know, intelligent, competent, you know, good hearted man. He's just a complete schmuck in terms of personality. Yeah. But when we look at the girls whole other well, usually a whole other story. Yeah, usually a whole other me, story. And you have girls with a lot of various personalities. They're not all doormats. That's the first well, complaint. And again, I'd say that at least a small majority of them aren't. Well, Lum. Yeah. <laughs> Lum is no doormat. Yeah, the, the original was no doormat. The original was feisty, spiteful. Yeah. And again, going back to the I Dream of Genie thing, if you've ever seen the episodes where Genie gets pissed off and just uses her powers to beat the shit out of Major Nelson, that's every other episode of Urusei Yatsura. And if you haven't seen it, quick explanation, uh, Schmuck Everyman is the schmuckiest of everymen, who is a complete and unrepentant lech who wants to build his own harem. So he's constantly trying, even though he does love and care for Lum, he's constantly trying to get away from her so he can hit on other girls. And La, and unfortunately for him, the girl who is his self-proclaimed wife can shoot lightning out of her fingers. Results are predictable and hilarious. You'll never get tired of seeing Ataru get his ass shocked. Well, the funny thing is, it's it's kind of like uh, how they did uh, in like the first couple of episodes of Pokemon with Pikachu. It's like he just gets used to it and actually gets good at dealing with it. I want to bring up as well to show this off. You have girls that are actually kind of a. Bad influence. I mean, I from Video Girl on. You know, oh Video god, Girl yeah. I is delinquent. <laughs> to be honest, part of the whole premise, because like you know, kind of you know, moving away from that you know ideal wife scenario, like as the name of Video Girl, I suggest she came out of a videotape. And yes, that's a real thing. A major plot point is Schmuck Everyman's crappy VCR f***ed up the tape, so now like. Her boobs are smaller, she doesn't know how to cook anymore, she's kind of bitchy. Like, she actually flat out explains that. And it's fun because the premise, of course, at the onset is, okay, so she's flawed because he had a lousy VCR. But, but. she turns out to be much better than he had hoped for because, yeah, because she's more of a real person. She has much more going on. She's more interesting. Yeah. There's a lot like that that goes on. There is a lot more real woman <laughs> in these magical girls than frequently are given credit for. Well, which is another way that the magical girl genre often shines above the harem genre, which is, especially when you have crap like Galaxy Angel, an excuse to show, okay, here's six different flavors of women so we can sell every one a particular body pillow. Right. The premise is girlfriend. There's the idea that these are eventually going to be partners. She needs to stand on him in some level. She needs to be flawed on some level. Oh. And she needs to be amazing in some level. I mean, then you get to uh, Princess Calm from Outlanders, which is simultaneously all three, and easily the craziest among them. Even more so than Lum, and that's saying something. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, how the two of them meet, because she's like some kind of alien princess. She's plundering Earth because she was bored and has daddy issues. Her daddy is like some big emperor. So, when you're dealing with that kind of crazy and those kinds of power levels, the two of them meet because she's just wrecking the city, massacring soldier after soldier with a sword. She decides not to murder him because he's kind of cute, so she takes him home as a pet. And that's how the relationship started. <laughs> And that also brings us to another great, great, great thing about the genre, the writing. Yes. Um, well, it's it's ridiculous, wacky, and zany, but it manages to keep taking itself seriously. Well, it's a, it's a truth of writing. Yes. It's a truth of writing. The more absurd the circumstance, the more intimate it can be. Mm hmm And if you, you don't believe me, it's because you haven't realized it yet. When things are absurd, when things are amplified, it's all of a sudden okay to put the barest of human truths right out the, you know, right up on the screen in well, front of everyone. Well, let's be honest, that's kind of what Monty Python banked on most of the time. Yes. That Python humor 
is based in the idea that once it's absurd, you're comfortable with it. Yeah. So you can say something horrifically blasphemous or something horrif you know, horrifically offensive or something that's really hitting close to home, but because it came out of the mouth of a man with <laughs> walrus teeth or, yeah. you know, or a man in drag, all of a sudden it's fine. Yep. Well, I mean, hell, Ursa Yatsura, they had a, a whole episode where they parodied Ten Little Indians. And just all the characters just systematically getting getting killed off. Spoiler alert, they weren't really dead, but that's not really spoiling anything because it's in the middle of the series. You kind of expect that much, but... But as far as Ataru knows, they've all died horrific deaths. And it just... You don't get the comedy reveal until the last minute of the episode. And it's not all humor, either. No, no, not... A, well, again, Oh My Goddess, there's a... Oh My Goddess does, does the such great balancing of, you know... Well, of course, you know, there's the romantic comedy, humor, wacky, zany, craziness aspect, but there's also, you know, some fantasy adventure even to it, and there's a whole lot of, you know, just real human drama in it. Oh My Goddess is a series that takes the setup of a young man, a, a, a young man, a college undergrad, falling in love with and moving in with a literal goddess, yes. and uses that setup not to, not always. It does <laughs> use that setup to, you know, he, he discovers how heaven works. He dis, he discovers all these fantastic beings, but in the same pages, <laughs> in the same scenes, he's worrying about what what do I get her for her birthday? Does she have a birthday? Yeah. What's an you know, what's a date that's actually going to impress? Well, that's her? the thing. It's like like just within the first chapter, he's just so utterly adjusted to. Oh, okay, my might as well be wife. Effectively, is an actual deity. Oh, f what do I get her for her birthday? What music does she like? Yeah, I mean, granted, it, if I had to level any criticism at it, I will say at this point it. It works for the writing, so I'm not going to even call it a criticism, but if I had, I guess if I had to criticize Bell Dandy anyway, it seems that she just likes whatever he likes. That is the one shallow bit about her character. I will have to put that out there. And it's, it's, you know, she likes whatever, she, but it's more that she appreciates anything he's enthusiastic about, and she's very accepting of it. I mean, right. there are points where she, there it's made very clear that she has her own likes. Yes. But... She's just so tolerant and accepting. Yes. But that kind of just goes to her whole character being perfection. Yes. Which is why we have her sisters to be imperfect. Yeah, which is another, which is actually another thing they ripped right out of. Uh, yeah, Bell Dandy's older sister Erd is ripped right out of uh, I Dream of Jeannie with uh, Jeannie's older sister, like almost verbatim. But getting back, yeah, getting back to the topic, not always humor. You have some shows that are very hardcore science fiction like Outlanders. You have some shows that are extremely deep character drama with barely any humor at all like uh, She the Ultimate Weapon, uh, Psychono, yep. which is gripping, almost evil in the way it, yeah, I mean, it portrays things. I mean, things. I have mixed feelings about that to be perfectly honest, but yeah. Uh, there are shows that move away from the idea that, you know, that move away from the idea of just blatant humor to something a little bit more low-key. I mean, Video Girl Eye is yeah, again. very low-key. And you still get the zany. I mean, you have to really take the shows one at a time mm. to see what they do with this same formula. The formula is only a skeleton. Yes. You start, you can hang whatever you want on it. Well, and that's the great thing about the genre. It's like this basic premise is so incredibly flexible. It's and it, and it's more, but it, it, it's incredibly flexible. But it's still more structured than oh, this is a thing with ninjas and the main character fights to get stronger. Shonen <coughs> <Go> and jump. <clears throat> and the thing that I personally think the genre has going for it, possibly more than anything else, is emotional impact. Yes. Well, that's, that's the whole point, you know, these great memorable characters with this, at least usually, good, uh, good strong writing, means you actually give a crap about these people. 
we, we outlined earlier that there's a degree of wish fulfillment yes. in this genre, a degree of power fantasy. But it's much more than that because at its core, at its very basic, at that skeleton, mm. is something so intrinsic to human, you know, to hu the human experience. Falling in love with someone, finding someone who interests you, finding somebody you don't necessarily feel equal to. Yeah. Inequality in relationships and reaching equality in a relationship, that's one of the biggest challenges in all of our lives. Yep. Well, I mean, and even going along with that, let's not forget the basic premise of any of these is someone who's not all that interesting and is, gen and is nine times out of ten stuck in some kind of rut, all of a sudden has someone come into their life who just completely shakes things up. I mean, it, it's it's just as exciting as it is mundane. Right. This is everyday genre, yeah, everyday drama, writ large, by just escalation. Yes. <laughs> a little bit of escalation, a little bit of absurdity, and we can tell the story of the most human experience. So I hope we've really laid that out pretty well for you. And we'll move on to this week's recommendation because, Mike, this is another one of those uh, neatly tied in, if not perfectly fit. Yes. Um, however, I'm going to undo some of that because I want to actually start with a bit of a, I guess, tirade, you could almost call it, that ties in with this. See, I have a bone to pick with things like Harry Potter and Twilight and all that other stuff, but not necessarily the one you might think I'm about to. You see, for me, when you take elements of everyday life and mix in, you know, fantasy or science fiction elements, etc., etc., your goal, your end goal should be to take the mundane and make it fantastic. I mean, look at Star Wars, like, like Star Wars, Star Wars. The whole first act of that, young farm boy wants to get off the farm and see the world. His first step out into the real world gets his ass kicked in a bar. Half of rural America has lived that. It's that mundane. But put it in this backdrop, and it's, it's this grand, epic, timeless space opera. What Twilight and Harry Potter and all those others do is the exact opposite. They take the fantastic and they make it mundane. Uh, it's primarily with both of them focusing on school. If anime has taught us anything, like Project Echo, for instance, you can use school as a backdrop, but it should not be any kind of major focus. School should be an absurd setting. It should be a setting that makes the elements that are about to occur seem more ridiculous. Yes. Not, oh, uh, you go to school... Like, you can have, you go to school to learn to be a magic user, but it should not be like a normal classroom. But anyway, getting off of that, one of my absolute favorite examples, at least ones that no one really uh, knows about too much, of taking the mundane and making it fantastic, is Makoto Shinkai's premiere piece, Voices of a Distant Star. Have your hankies ready. Yeah. Uh, see this... It is this, you know, albeit it's a it's a half hour long short film, so I should you know frame it into that. But this is like the sort of grand narrative, you know, involving all kinds of elements from you know mecha series, space operas, war dramas, some cool mech designs, cool ship designs, all kinds of you know like scientific talk about uh, faster than light space travel. But when you strip it down to its core. All it's about, it's, it's the story of two childhood friends and then one moves away. You cannot get more mundane than that. We have, every single one of us, have lived that or has known someone who has lived that. It's so human. Shinkai really does human very well. You'll, if you didn't know him from Voices of a Distant Star, you probably know him from 5 centimeters a second. And, or one of his more recent works, but Voices of a Distant Star was his breakout hit. Yeah. 
and what a way to do it. Self-created. Yeah, this is, uh, aside from some of the, you know, post-post-production uh, and actually, you know, putting it out there, every artwork, animation, character designs, writing, all done by him and him alone. In fact, there's actually a director's cut where all the voices, of which there are really only two anyway, are done by him and his wife. And passion projects yes. like that are another big thing here at you know, here at Maison Otaku. When you're talking about a singular artistic vision by an impassioned, invested person, we will always get up and stand behind you on that one, almost regardless of the finished product, because you tried. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing. It's like, even if I don't too much care for what you're doing, it's like, like freaking Cat Soup, there's an example. It's like, I don't particularly care for it, but I'm glad, still glad you did it. Yes. It's boilerplate, let's <laughs> sell some body pillows that <laughs> pisses us off. Yes. But anyway, um, and uh, I do want to, uh, little spoiler alert, I'm basically just going to explain the story, so if you don't want to hear what happens, just skip to the end. Uh, but, the basic setup is, uh, there's this girl who's something of a prodigy mech pilot, uh, and actually I should say even years before that, um, it's actually kind of the same uh, story as Yukikaze almost where years ago aliens invaded Earth, we fought them back, and now we're taking the fight to their homeworld uh, set up. So she pilots uh, this mech called a Tracer, and I have to say, another another case of me liking really weird, obscure stuff. Uh, the Tracer, it's it's kind of wonky looking, but at it's one of my favorite grunt suits. Like, it has, like, this uh, wrist weapon that's, like, simultaneously an automatic laser cannon that doubles as a beam sword with variable length. It has these, like, giant rockets out of its back. It has, like, its own personal energy field. It has, like, all these rifles and stuff it can carry. And Shinkai, honestly, doing the smart decision here, all of that's just shown there. There's no, like, technician explaining all this stuff. It's like, no, here's what the mech can do. Let's just show it within story context. But anyway, so that's all explained. Uh, this girl, Mikako, is chosen to go with the first fleet to find the alien homeworld, and her uh, kind of sort of boyfriend, uh, Noboru, is back on Earth, and they have apparently in the future uh, a Nokia cell phone can communicate across space, but that's just kind of one of those things we as the audience uh, are made to accept, so it's like, yeah, okay, I'll buy that. Um, here's the thing. Not only does the time in between messages get longer because of the great distances between them, but because they are using faster than light travel methods, they actually take into relativity into account. So, like at first, it's, you know, a few days uh, for a message to get there. By the end, it's like it takes something like a year, like one or two years for the message to go from her to him and back and forth. By the end, because of relativity, a very, very short explanation, if there's anyone who doesn't know relativity, the very basic premise is your passage of time is based on your specific inertial reference frame, i.e. The, the faster you go, the slower time moves, moves for you is the important point here. So they're the same age when it starts out. By the end of the movie, she's only aged a year, he's aged about ten. And, it's, and that's where the beauty of this comes in. Where, like I said, it takes the mundane and makes it fantastic. This is these two people who love each other who are not now not only separated by space, but also by time. Interestingly enough, if you want a similar scientifically accurate take on a story like this... Yeah, I kind of figured you'd bring this up. Well, it's one of my favorites. Well, yeah, you can't not talk about Gunbuster. <laughs> I'm, Gunbuster actually is another good oh, one. Oh, what were you going to talk about? <laughs> The song, the song 39 by Queen off of oh. Night of the Opera. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is the sort of weird shit that you'll expect here. Yes. But Gunbuster... Wait, wait, was that, was, that, was that the one you played for me because you wanted me to hear a Queen song that didn't sound like regular Queen? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, no, I don't... I don't. I want to say I really don't like Queen, but I did actually think that song was alright. Don't hold that against it. This is... It's a Queen song about a group of explorers who set off to find a new Earth. 
and they're traveling faster than light. So when they return to Earth, you know, everybody's age, and the, you know, the lead explorer gets back, and he meets his daughter, who's an adult woman, and his wife has passed away. But they did succeed in their mission, so there's this, so that it's this very bittersweet thing. And it's one of the few Queen songs where Brian May sings lead rather than Freddie Mercury, yes. so that's cool too. But, again, same principle, si that science taking a mundane yes. story, so, uh, man leaves, comes back home, <laughs> home to, why, you know, to how society has changed, and just ramps it up yep. to show just how how this pulls at you, how this grabs you, and the fact that we can cite that readily three examples of even that same scientific principle telling the same emotional yep. story, and each one is fresh, unique, and gripping in its own way, tells you this is what writing does. Yes. This is what storytelling does. This is what unique perspectives do. This is why, Mike, what what do you say about originality? Oh, yes, yes. Well, a case in point there, too. I have said previously on the show, and I will continue to say until the day that I die, a quality knockoff will always be preferable to a poor original. It's like, honestly, very quick side way. Uh, Jim uh, Sterling once commented that innovation is the snake oil of gaming and that innovation can be good but innovation for innovation's sake doesn't necessarily solve a damn thing so too will i say that originality is the snake oil of writing i came up with an original idea is it any you're... good am i going to enjoy it yeah i mean i yeah i like superman yeah so, so you tell me but of course we're also old fuddy duddies. Yep. And on that note. <laughs> on that note. Yeah. So yeah. Um. Well, having enjoyed an entire episode about us talking about you know taking the fan the mundane and making it fantastic, we hope this gets out there and makes it so people will stop making things like Harry Potter and Twilight and all those stupid tween books. But that's just me. Yeah. Um. And but I, but yeah. more than anything, we hope you all have a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, whatever. Yeah. Thank you all. See you. Yeah, we'll see you soon. Take yeah, take care. And from all of us here at Maison Otaku, this is Mike and Justin saying, enjoy what you watch and share what you enjoy with someone you love. Who preferably isn't made of cotton and stuffed with filling. Yeah, if your uh, if your girlfriend or boyfriend's flame retardant. Cause you need to be back in the arms of a good friend And I need to be back in the arms of a girlfriend I didn't know nobody And then I saw you coming my you need to back in the arms of a good friend Oh, cause honey, believe me She'll love to call you my girlfriend
looking for someone to 